Scribal Conservatory. All right, here we go. Let's see. <laughs> okay, boom, boom, boom. All right, live. Oh, thank you, thank you. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, everyone, you all know that I'm kind of special when it comes to, um, I, I'm very good at technology. I'm just not the best at Facebook, you know, and, and it's, you know, I don't like doing lives or things like that. I'm only being obedient to Christ in this process, but I just wanted to let you know that we were live in the scribal prophets group. <laughs> yes. So we weren't live in um, where we should have been live. So again, I just want to welcome you. I'm, I'm very grateful for those that are joining us on Zoom. And um, LA, do I need to, my screen is still being shared? Yes, I can see the uh, Scribe Conservatory. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. So just for um, just for letting you all know what's going on, you can join via Zoom because some people have a lot of struggle with um, Facebook. So we're doing Zoom for those people that want to be a part. And also if the opportunity presents itself, we make room for you to be able to share. But if you're not someone who normally fellowships with us, we're, you know, we want you to know upfront that we mute people. <laughs> we we bump people out of the group. If there is any comments that are, that aren't in line with what we're doing, or if there's any kind of conflict, because this is a Bible study, and I want to let you know that we can have different opinions in this Bible study. I'm not trying to make anybody believe anything. My goal is to push you into studying, and so I hope that makes a whole lot of sense because we want we need people who study the Bible. I've been encouraging everyone to get a printed Bible and just put your hands on it, less distractions, um, easier to study, more focus. We're able to really um, fall in love with the written word again. We are the Scribal Conservatory, so I'm always going to push this. And I want to just thank Prophet LA and for the way she supports and stands with me on this. She has her own ministry. But there's something to be said when people make sacrifices to help you and they don't have to. So um, LA, at any time, you are more than welcome to jump in, help me teach, add anything that God gives you, um, clarify something like you normally do. Okay. And I'm always open to the word of the Lord. <laughs> you Amen. Know, speaking or if he's speaking through some form of poetry or spoken word. But I want to thank you on tonight. It's really a, a blessing, a blessing to have you join us. If you have questions in Zoom or on Facebook, know that I am not um, really, I'm not following the Facebook chat, so I have no idea what's going on. So LA will let me know if something happens and then if she's talking, I'll try to get on there and look so that I'll know. It, just because I'm not really good at doing two or three things at once when I'm streaming live. I might accidentally hit something and we will just be offline and I'm still teaching by myself. So <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. So just, just be encouraged. Um, we're not going through any of this. I'm just scrolling through. We are having our Bible studies on uh, next Tuesday, we'll have a Bible study. So if you are, this is after Thanksgiving. <laughs> so hopefully you'll still be able to join us. I just wanna put that out there. Don't ever worry about the link. We'll always post it, even if it's like five minutes before we go live. So if you do wanna go on Zoom, we're gonna show up. Don't worry, we won't forget you. We won't forget you and we'll always post the link inside the Bible study group, or you can register in advance for it. Just so you all know, I do have a cash app now. Um, we do have ministry, an address for you to sow or give if you want. And we also have that on PayPal. Well, that's the end of that. We won't spend any more time on that. Now we're gonna be talking about identifying false prophecy. So Father, we just thank you for the teaching on tonight. We thank you for guiding us. 
for directing us. We thank you for your heart and your will being present. We thank you, Father, that this will be about Christ, that he will be elevated, that we will not focus our attention on people and accusations and all the things that can cloud your word and that can cloud our understanding. What I really want the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. And Father, we just pray this over any who would desire to share or speak tonight that that rings clear in our ears, Father, because we're desiring to be led of the spirit, not led of our own soul. In Jesus' name, guide this Bible study, Holy Spirit. Let your spirit be upon all those who speak and who share in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to be going over five critical, um, well, I should say five critical principles that help us understand um, identify false prophecy. So that part of the slide is not correct. What we want to do is just basically say there are five keys. Now tonight, I'm only talking about one of them. If you all are familiar with the way that I teach, it would be severe overload for me to go through all five of these because I tend to be a, a lot detailed with you. I like to give you um, a lot of information and sometimes that's too much for people. But if you're a part of the conservatory, you will get used to me and it will, in your capacity will increase and you'll learn how to navigate the way that I, I teach. And I give credit to this to a mentor years ago, back in 2006, 2007. Um, one thing that she always told me and that she always told those who walk with her was that we have the capacity to understand if we allow the spirit to stretch us beyond what's comfortable. And so one of the reasons why I give people a lot of information sometimes is to challenge you, is to challenge your thinking, is to break seals on your, off your life, is to cause us to, uh, us to connect the dots. It's, it's different things, but I'm gonna take on Bible study nights more time so we're going to talk about one principle tonight of identifying false prophecy. But I want to give you a basic definition. And this is just very bones. There's a whole lot of more things we can say about this. But for the purpose of this Bible study, I think it's important that we work within something very, very basic. So false prophecy, I'm defining this as in our faith, it is words, actions, or deeds from a person claiming a divine gift of some kind or access to speak for or on behalf of God that contradict the Lord's intention and purposes for prophecy. So, so that's how we are defining um, false prophecy in the midst of this. Very, very simple. Um, you can make it more complicated. You can add tons of information on this, but this is just bare bones and we need to just look at the foundations. And I want you to see this first principle that I'm going to share with you as probably things we should have learned in the school of the prophets, <laughs> you know, in our church ministry groups, you know, something that, and some of you probably already have. My goal here is not to cause you to have a lot of revelation about this. To me, this is not a revelational teaching, but some people might consider it to be so. It's very basic and it's very simple, but this is my challenge to you before I go forward. I want you to ask yourself, what does it mean to reveal Christ? What does that mean to you? I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about what does that look like in your lifestyle? What does that look like in your speech? What does that look like in your writing? What does that look like when you come face to face with someone you don't particularly care for? So I'm asking you that question because it is the most important question we can ask ourselves when it comes to us prophesying, 
when it comes to understanding the gift of prophecy versus um, the office of the prophet. And I'm not teaching on those two areas um, right now, but we will eventually within the conservatory get to that because I have some different concepts that kind of pull us out of the circus. Most of what I teach is to help people see Jesus versus people. And we're gonna kind of stay on that path. So grab hold of this basic definition for this teaching. Again, it's for this teaching. I wanna give you some insight on what I consider to be um, different sources of, of false prophecy. And we all know that false prophecy comes from what, you know, we were to listen to every person who calls people, everybody they see as a false prophet, if they get something wrong, listen, that's not the case. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at this because it's very important. So without hesitation, we know that the scripture speaks of false prophecy from several perspectives. This is very, very important and very foundational to our teaching. Um, so I want you to consider that there's more than one perspective. Everybody who prophesies wrong is not a witch. <laughs> so we've got to somehow get over some of this stuff that we spew from our mouths. So we know that there are prophets of Baal. Prophets of Baal has been with us since the church formed. And we, we know everything that happened with, with false prophets in the old covenant. We know what that looks like in the new covenant. Some of you have taught classes and workshops. So we do know that we can use the phrase prophets of Baal for the realm of witchcraft. And when I use this term, I'm going to give you my understanding for what we're doing because you can use it however you want. But when we're teaching, we need to be on the same page. So when I say prophets of Baal, I'm talking about people in other, in, in cults, people in um, other, well, I wouldn't even call it a religion, but practice other spiritual things. They may have their own prophets. And so, you know, they're operating with familiars and all this other stuff, real sorcery. So that, that, uh, that was, that happens. But then we also have heresy. And I just want our heretics. And it's when the philosophical mind is at odds with divine truth to a point where God's intention is unrecognizable. And people who are heretics can be extremely violent in thought and action. Now, I'm not giving you scriptures here because listen, you need to study it out. Paul talked about being attacked by heretics all the time. People were always coming up against him with philosophy. And, and what I mean by that, I'm not talking about the study of philosophy or being philosophical. I'm talking about heresy where people are literally forming their own spirituality based on what the Bible says, as opposed to what the Bible really says or what the scripture really intends. Then you have the most common place where we have um, a lot of false prophecy, error and maturity and experience, not enough knowledge and understanding of what prophecy is, mistaking the prophetic gift for the office of the prophet. We see that one a lot. That's pretty much what's happening on social media, to be honest with you. You have a whole lot of people that are very immature in their um, understanding of the prophetic overall. And as a result, you have a lot of people giving exhortation, comfort, and encouragement, thinking that that is the office of the prophet or they're speaking into things that they don't understand. So there's a lot of error. And uh, most people that have trouble with prophecy or that we sometimes hear people call false prophets, a lot of these people are just immature. And so we need to know that. That's why I use the term false prophecy. False prophecy. You know, if we're, we're dealing with the prophets of Baal, I have no problem saying false prophet. If we're dealing with heresy, doctrines of men, you know, things like that, I'll say false prophet. But when it comes to error and maturity and experience, I feel more godlike and more tuned in to Christ to say the prophetic word is false. 
and the person is in error. So I want to encourage you with that um, because I, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about that. It's just so easy to walk around calling people witches and Jezebels. And, and I don't know how we can sleep at night doing that, knowing that most of us have, are, or will walk in error, errors of immaturity and errors of inexperience. Even pastors who think they own this make mistakes when it comes to releasing prophetic words. One of the most profound things that I've ever seen in my own life is being around leaders who don't mind coming forward and saying, y'all, I miss God on this. Oh my God, I miss God. I respect that. And I love watching God correct it without us having to make a whole lot of accusations. And right now the congregation is really in a crisis. We seeing people fighting over their favorite prophet. We seeing people defending people, but I struggle with that because who is defending Jesus? Who is standing up for him and his church? We're too busy dividing over our camp and our club and our group and our little few peeps that we are totally missing the division that is coming forth because we're fighting over somebody's accusation that somebody else is a false prophet and they probably are, but why do we have to fight about it? <laughs> I mean, what, what is it that God wants? What is it that, what is the intention of Christ in the midst of this? All of this falls in that, in, in, in these categories somewhere. Then we have the reprobate. See, these are the ruthless who are convinced and convicted that they have a vice on the prophetic, on the gospel, and that everyone else is wrong. These, they, and hell bound and blind, these are the real religious fanatics. You can't reason with them. You can't talk to them. You can't have a comment. You can't have a different opinion. You can't, I mean, they want it. They want you dead. That, that, this is, this is the, the dangerous reprobate place. And it's a dangerous thing to enter into this place before a holy God. Because while everybody else, people give up on you, I promise you, until God says he's given up, everything else people say is a bunch of crap. I, I remember something David said that I loved. And I love this. David said, I'd rather fall into the hands of an angry God than into the hands of a man. In other words, people are dirty. So when you get into this area of the reprobate, you're talking about these non-compassionate people that feel like they can tell you whether you're bound for hell or not. These are people that, that feel like they have the power to split your soul from spirit. These are the kinds of people that are dangerous to the body. Dangerous to the body. And, and the purpose of this teaching over the next couple of weeks, again, I'm only going to do one principle tonight. It may take two other Bible studies to cover this. I may be able to finish it up next week with the other four principles, but we'll see. But in the church, we fight hard against um, heresy. Some of yeah, heresy, we fight hard against error and we fight hard against reprobate. The prophets of Baal, that's a whole nother story. We don't even have to contend with that. <laughs> we just need to close our ears to that. You know, that's not something that we should entertain. Um, but that's another story too, because people have different opinions on that. I look forward to talking about new covenant warfare at some point of what that looks like. I mean, just based on some things that I've already shared over the last um, three, almost four years in the conservatory, three years in the conservatory going on four, not quite four yet. We haven't hit that mark. We'll be entering that fourth birthday in January, but that's it. So I just need to get some of these things out of the way before we get into it, because we have an exercise. If you have your Bibles, make sure they're already open to um, Matthew 5. And I'm just going to challenge y'all. If y'all want to do something fun, take a picture of your printed Bibles. 
take a um, picture of your printed Bibles or and, and Matthew five, and just post them if you can uh, on Facebook. You know, inside the chat or whatever. Just letting us know. I don't know if you can do that, but just letting us know. Or post it somewhere and tag me. I got my Bible, so that we can encourage other people to grab hold of their Bibles. We need to do more than that. Now there may be more more categories in this. I'm not trying to be the guru of sources of false prophecy. I'm just giving you some things to, to think about. All right, so we're moving forward. Remember, prophets of Baal, heresy, error in maturity and experience, um, being reprobate, you know, the and the thing about being reprobate, look that up, it's that place in which the Lord gives people over to their own mind. In other words, he's not trying to deal with you. He's saying, look, believe what you want to believe. And he just kinds of let that have, because you can't teach unteachable people. That's basically what the Lord is saying. If you're unteachable, I mean, if, if somebody's telling you what they're going to do, and then they have the nerve to ask for your advice, you give them your advice, and then they tell you what the Lord told them. What was the whole point of that entire conversation? What was the point? You already knew what you were going to do before you asked, and you weren't planning on changing your mind. So it's really good to know how to meet people in their conversation. But in this particular instance, we're dealing with the ruthlessness of people who want you to believe what they believe. And if you don't believe what they believe about craziness and foolishness, then something's wrong with you, not them not them. So if you have questions about this, feel free to ask later. I know some of you may have questions from Sunday. I had definitely, if you can, and you're listening, post your questions in that other thread. And if we have a few minutes after this, I don't mind answering them for you at all. So next. All right. So we must make room for growth in the life of anybody who desires to prophesy. Anybody who desires to prophesy. I think Paul said, you know, that, that of all the spiritual gifts, he said, I, you know, I'm glad you speak in, you know, he, he, he felt like prophecy was a key to wisdom and understanding. And I agree. But that's from the perspective of the gift, being able to encourage yourself build yourself. Thank you for those of you that are sharing that you've got your Bible. Oh my gosh, that blesses me a whole lot. Thank you for sharing in the scribal, in the um, scribal conservatory group. So I just want to say to you, don't be trigger happy with calling people false prophets. Can we all just agree that we're not going to rush and do that? And we can, because we can kill learners. We can kill people who are developing their gift. We can put out the fire to prophesy. You know, we can, we don't want to be that person or, or a part of that group saying, look at you, look at you, you need to sit down. You know, there's a way to correct. When, um, a you know, we, we, we see, I think it was in Acts 25. I can't remember who it is. Maybe it was Apollo, Apollos who was being corrected by um, a prophetic team, a husband and wife. And they were like, listen, you're teaching and you're a good preacher, but listen, let me teach you a better way because he didn't know about the spirit of the Lord. He preached Christ, but he wasn't preaching the outpouring of the spirit. If someone knows what scripture that is, I believe it's Acts. I don't know, but it's in the book of Acts for sure. And I would definitely, you can post that scripture in, the, in, in um, the chat room here, or you can post that scripture in the, um, in Facebook on, under the, under the feed, under the live, because I think that's an important scripture. We must recognize that some people have been raised up in error. They have been taught to be sons of hell. We have to make room for that. We have to make room for that. So we were, we are taught to discern what it, what God, what we are to discern is what God calls good. And from what God identifies evil. Here's a point for you. Part of what I'm getting ready to share with you is this, please, please, please 
begin to ask yourself based on what you've learned about Christ, what are the things that God hates and what he loves? And when you're searching the scriptures, look for what God said he hates. God said, I hate this. I hate that. What did he says he despises, he abhors, he hates. Don't just go and pick something you saw. I know that um, I'm going to pull it up later. I think I'll do that anyway and show you. But he hates anything that causes division. He hates liars. His, uh, he hates feet that run quickly to shedding innocent blood. I mean, he, so he has a list of what he despises. And I'm going to tell you, studying that list and, saying, and another thing he says that he despises everything that men raise up. That's a profound scripture. I know we love to count our favorite sins, but there are some scriptures where the Lord uses the word horror, hate, despise, abhor, Please look at those scriptures because they deal with two things. They deal with how to love him and how to love other people. So please, and I'll, I'll post that. LA, don't let me forget. Just make a little note for me to post the scriptures about the things that God hates because it's going to tie in with this Bible study and all, you know, everything we're going to do. Okay. Um, also, some people are like Apollos. I talked about that and are powerful in their calling, but young and immature. Um, some people don't know the difference between the prophetic gift and the office of the prophet. Now, I said 99% of the confusion is here. That's just me being exagger exaggerating things. But my point is, it is the truth. A whole lot of people don't know what prophecy is. They think that having a word for somebody is 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 oh i don't know they just think that having a word for somebody is the it <laughs> and you know and and i'm glad and we're grateful for that gift we are not to despise prophecy in any form when it's the lord but the office of the prophet is very 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 different very different so i hope that this has brought some clarity as we now begin to go into the scriptures and then we're going to do a fun exercise together. I promise you, it's going to be fun. But in order to get it, you really needed this understanding that I provided because we have to kind of uproot a lot of the weird things that we've put on prophecy. A lot of the scariness of it. A lot of the um, fear of what the Lord is saying. And, and I, I know that I grew up around... Um, I had a good balance in the environment that I grew up around, even when I was in a ministry that I had to leave. They taught a great balance in the prophetic. And they taught us the difference between the operation of the office of the prophet and the operation of the prophetic gift. And then the spirit of prophecy, of course, that. But this is what you need to know. And this is where we're going right now. I've already talked to you. We're not bashing anyone. So listen, we're going to identify false prophecy. We're not, um, and if I was doing this in person inside our school, I would pull out my book of false prophecy that I have of people that have prophesied things that could not possibly be the Lord, not because I discerned it wasn't the Lord, but because it didn't follow the principles of prophecy that are before us in the scripture. So I will say that. Also, you can, and, and it, I just encourage you, do this with your own prophecy. I've done it with mine. If you all are brave, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use myself as an example. I have been blogging since 2001, faithfully, for 19 years. Almost every prophecy that I thought was a prophetic word that God has given me, I have on my website, chamberofthescribe.com. If you are to read those prophecies, you will see tons and tons of error from when I first started out. 
You will see a mixture of God, a mixture of religion. You will hear things that God said, but you will hear me in it too. And you will see how it cleared up over the years. You'll see how I started growing up. And by the time I get to 2009, 2010, those prophecies don't look anything like the prophetic words I was releasing in 2001 and in 2002. I'm not ashamed to leave those things up because I believe they can teach people way better than I can concerning humility, concerning how we grow, concerning spiritual development, because we got a lot of prophetic people today that want you to think they don't make mistakes. They want you to think that they are perfect all the time. They want you to think that they never miss God. Well, if God's speaking, you ain't never gonna miss him. That's not true. That's not true. We grow. Oh my goodness. So we're gonna identify false prophecy, avoid becoming a part of the problem. That's the second reason why we're doing this because as conservators, we don't wanna be a part of the problem. We wanna be people that are slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak. Oh my goodness, we wanna gain tools to help you recognize whether or not the Lord is speaking. How can I know for sure that the Lord is speaking? Listen, we all know the popular scriptures, get two or three witnesses, but if you got two or three witnesses with the same spirit as you, how is that gonna help? If y'all all under the same familiar spirit or the same error, or the same doctrine. We need other things. So I'm listen, we're not really going to deal with the popular ways of um, discerning scripture. I'll bring them in at the end, but I want to give you some things called built on the word. I want to tell you right now that you will never be able to accurately discern a prophetic word if you do not read the Bible. Write that down. If you listen to people more than you listen to God, more than likely you are struggling or really don't know how to discern whether that prophetic word is accurate because bearing witness with your spirit can be dangerous if you yourself are in a whole lot of error and you don't know it. I'll tell you this, same level is not always good. I've seen people running prophetic words across their friends. Well, your friends don't know anything more than you. So it always helps to have other mentors, people that have a better understanding, greater revelation, whose lives are clean. I gotta say that your life needs to be clean talking about interpreting a prophecy. We're going to get to that in a minute. Because, you know, people who are reprobate have all kind of rules for everybody else. But they can live any way that they want to. And they have no conviction of sin. None. They don't care if they leave you bleeding in the street. They don't care. But error can operate like that too. And we covered that but I just want to throw that out there. You guys are still with me? Are we still here? Yeah. I know some of you are seasoned. I don't want to um, make you feel like you're babies. Some of you have probably been teaching on the prophetic longer than I have. So this is not that. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to give us a way to avoid becoming a part of the problem to identify false prophecy when it comes, to gain tools to help you recognize whether or not the Lord is speaking. Okay, principle number one, Christ must be revealed. Christ must be revealed. Listen, everything God has ever done has been to reveal himself to humankind. 
Do you agree? Do you agree? Let me know you agree. I need to see some feedback on this. Yes. Because this is very important. They're saying yes. Okay, good, good, good. Now, re remember the whole Bible. This is so important. Everything in the Bible is about revealing God. That's the whole point. And it's about revealing God to mankind, to humanity. And I know you agree. Now, that needs to be at the very top of your list. That's why I asked you the question, how is what I am prophesying revealing Christ to me right now? How is Christ being revealed? Well, see, this is the problem. If you, if you don't know that, if you don't know him, the Christ of the word, if you don't know him, you're not going to be able to answer this question. You're not going to be able to discern whether Christ is speaking. You're, uh, you're not going to be able to discern it because some principles Hear me out, never change. And this is one of them. Revealing Christ didn't change when it was just God dealing with people in the old covenant. God sending his spirit on certain people. God dealing with people to reveal himself. Oh my goodness. Christ revealed God. Every single thing Christ did was to reveal God, follow me, please. Whoa, then Holy Spirit revealed Christ. His coming, his number one reason for coming was to help us have Christ revealed in us. A lot of people think that the greatest gift we ever received from Christ on the cross, my mentor teaches this. I've studied it out. I don't claim this revelation of my own, but God has turned it, flipped it, and just dug it out in me since she gave it. So give Dr. K full credit for this. I have to say that because I don't like claiming God told me anything. I am a student first, but I, I want you to know this. What if the, the fullness of Christ on that cross wasn't just that we were saved because the church focuses on salvation like it's just everything, and it is. But that fullness was the ability of Holy Spirit to live in us. How about that, you all? The real gift is that I am the temple. Listen to this, that I am now the temple of Holy Spirit. So we always hear people talking about, um, use me God and all of this stuff that we say, won't he do it? And we know that's a song and I love that song actually, but I'm just saying, we, we know that we say all of these things, but do we really understand that the spirit in you is there to reveal Christ. It's a straight line. God revealed himself. Christ revealed himself. Christ revealed God. Holy Spirit revealed Christ. And now we are revealing Christ through the spirit. It's, it's a chain. And it's a chain because we're one. We have now become one. The Christ in us reveals the spirit at work. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. Yes. All right, let's go. Here we go. Turn with me to Romans 1 and 20. Let me find out where that great scripture is. I am, yeah, here it is. Sorry, guys, that's my Facebook page. Um, so here it is, Romans 
1 and 20. This is what it says. It says, and I just want to read this. I'm not going to expouse it. I just want to read it. And you're probably reading it ahead of me. Um, don't ask me about the King James Version. That was an accident. I don't usually read from that version of the Bible. It says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So one of the first lines of prophecy is looking at what he created. Why is this important? Because I can look at the flowers in the morning and I can say, my God, you revealed yourself through a flower. My God, you revealed yourself through a bumblebee. Look at your majesty, how great I, I, thou art. You know, I was thinking about Job. We're not going to go there. But when Job got on God's nerves and he finally confronted him about his complaining and everything, God was like, where were you when I hung the moon and hung the stars? Where were you? In other words, God's saying to me, I've been revealing myself to you, Job. I've been revealing myself to you. I've been revealing myself to you, Job. So when people doing these nutty demonstrations, crazy things to my God told me to get a plastic cup and cut it up. And I mean, listen, I'm just being funny. I, I've seen people do some crazy stuff and give God credit for it. Like they're Ezekiel or somebody, but I'm here to tell you, we have to look at how Christ, how were you being revealed in that or was Christ being revealed? Is that to show you how great you are as a prophet or, or, or is that showing me something about Jesus that I need to know? I'm giving you a principle because most of the time people revealing themselves. <laughs> They're revealing themselves. They're not even shy about it. So you really, you have, you have to look. I'm going to close that passage because we don't need it anymore. I want you to see this. I'm going to show you in a different way. There are tons of scriptures to support this. The heavens declare the glory of God. What? The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Now, now, see, this is the reason I'm showing you this. Even the ant, the bird, the dog, the cat, the cow, they all reveal God. Oh, my God. Everything that has been created reveals him. You know, the scripture tells us in the old covenant, it says that everything knows its time and its seasons, except who? Man, we the only ones doing the most. We are. We are. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Yet they have no speech. They use no words. Listen, without us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, we would have no speech and no words. God, I hope you're getting this. Without the spirit who only reveals Christ, we would have no speech or no words. Without Christ who said, I only say what I hear the father say, I only do what I hear the father do. Without the revealing of the father in him, there would be no words. Oh God. Somebody please hear what the Lord is saying. But there is God who is determined, even if the rocks won't, he said, even if you won't cry out, the rocks will. Because I made the rocks. There's no two rocks 
that is exactly alike. Oh my God. Oh, I just hope you're hearing. If somebody says to you, God said, how is he being revealed? How is the heavens declaring the glory of God through that? Foundation. Foundation. Before I teach you how to prophesy, foundation you know, not that we can, before I teach you how to prophesy within the guidelines of the scripture, that's what I mean, because it's the spirit that teaches us to prophesy. It's the spirit that opens our mouth and gives us words that we have to filter through our whole and healed selves. Day after day, Teresa is supposed to pour forth speech. Night after night, Teresa is supposed to reveal knowledge of who Christ is. Some of this stuff, y'all, ain't God. It's people. And we have to be bold enough and brazen enough before God to repent and to recognize that we have bowed to men and not to God. There's a lot of prophecy operating in the earth right now that is not revealing Christ. It's dividing the body. We can never find unity in the opinions of men. Don't hate me. Study for yourself. Study everything in the new covenant that has to do with the revealing of Christ. Remember, some people don't know any better because they were raised by people who were operating in error. That's why it's so important. I have had to be healed of a lot of stuff, but I'm at a place in my life where I lose all my friends for the truth. I don't care about not being popular or, or well-known. This is God's ministry, not mine. If I had my way, I'm going to tell you, I would teach my group here in Atlanta and leave everybody else alone. But it's not God's will for me. So it's better to follow God than to do what Teresa wants. So I want you all to hear, this is not me trying to attack some pastor or leader. It's for you to know, for you to know how to discern, how to line things up. And you cannot, God reveals himself. There's no greater purpose in the earth. I dare you to challenge me on that. You cannot win. You cannot win. If it's not revealing Jesus, is not him. Oh, oh my God. Yet their voice goes out to, to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Oh my God, it is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Yeah, I can hear the voices now. Well, God rebukes. We're going to get there. It still reveals God. It still reveals Christ. When it's coming from the spirit, I promise you. I promise you, I'm going to show it to you in the new covenant. Psalm 19, bye. Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. We are handiwork. We're created to put him on display. We're created to reveal Christ. We are the temple of Holy Spirit. Oh my God. 
Oh, Jesus, help us, Lord. Um, I'm just going to read a part. I've taught on this so much. It's still highlighted from last time. The last many times I've taught on this. Um, John 14, it says, um, this is basically Jesus is comforting his disciples before his crucifixion and resurrection. Um, we don't have time to get into this, but I'm going to skip down to verse seven. It says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. Do you see the relationship? Because Christ is saying, I'm revealed to you, you know, Jesus is saying, I'm revealed to you. I'm God in the flesh. You know, I'm here. I'm revealing myself to you. But from now on, you know, if you have seen me, you've seen him. And then he goes and he says, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. Listen, how many people can say that about you? Be honest. God already know the truth. We need to be honest with ourselves. How many people can look at you and say Christ has been revealed? I'm asking you. It's, a, it's, it's the question we all have to ask ourselves. In the last prophecy that you gave, how has Christ been revealed? My heart is not to point to man, not, uh, not point to anybody. You can teach the word without pointing to yourself. I couldn't teach this without the spirit. I mean, we all know we've preached some dead sermons and messages. I preached stuff and God wasn't anywhere in it. But I'm telling you, I've repented. You get up and you try again and you keep going. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me? Oh, how many people can say you're in the father and that the father is in you? That you are leading. <laughs> I can say that about my mentor. I know Jesus is in it. I have no qualms about that. I'm not, she's not Jesus. I'm not Jesus to anybody, not the Holy Spirit. But there has to be a place. Paul asked the question like this. He said, if I am not an apostle to anyone on this planet, I should be an apostle to you. In other words, you should know Jesus is in me. That's what he said. That's what that question means. I have revealed Christ to you. Anyway, there's a lot there, but we're going to skip all the way down. Yeah, we're going to skip down. Um, no, we're going to go to the next chapter. No, I just want to skip that. Too much in that. I go to verse 15, um, all the way down to verse 26. John 15, verse 26. And I just want you to see this. When the advocate comes whom I will send to send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. What? Holy Spirit's primary responsibility is to reveal Christ. That, that's it. And if he has resided in you for real, for real, that's what he's supposed to be doing, convicting you at every opportunity, identifying the sin in your life, telling you where you need to correct, counter-correct, helping you experience the love of God left and right, helping you know you are forgiven. Conviction is grace. I want you all to hear this. Conviction, chastisement, and rebuke is grace. It's the love of God in the new covenant, not the wrath. Okay, I'm sorry. Study it, not my words. 
the difference between law and grace is that correction, rebuke for sons. Remember, I'm saying sonship. For sons and daughters, people in the faith is grace. Somebody will get that later. Y'all so quiet. Oh my God, y'all so quiet. I hope this is helping. Gonna show you something else. Get rid of that scripture. <laughs> Listen to this. Oh my goodness. Unity in the body. Just these six scriptures. Because you know everybody loves Ephesians 4.11. They can't wait to get to that. Because God calls some. Apostles, prophets. I mean we have just. <laughs> oh, people just love that. <laughs> but listen so let's go up here and we're just gonna stay here i therefore a prisoner whoa a prisoner for the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called man i guess christ walked worthy of being christ he, he had with all humility and gentleness not just a little bit of humility and gentleness let Holy Spirit dig all of that out in Teresa. Let him dig all of that out in Prophet LA. Let him dig all of that out in whoever else is listening. Well, you know, he, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, with bearing with one another in love. What? So I know, we, you know, we could go to 1 Corinthians 13. We don't have time for that. But the way that we're told to prophesy in love is the revealing oh my god there is one body and one spirit just as you were called so god jesus holy spirit me we're all called to one body you to one hope that belongs to your call the one hope is one lord one faith one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all, through all and in all is that we may be one. Why is this important? Because all prophecy under the new covenant comes to this end. It's supposed to paint a pathway clear the pathway, set the pathway, move the dross out, get the muck out of the way, deal with the crazy so we can all get to the one thing God wants more than anything in the world, a restored family. If that prophetic word causes people to die on the side of the road. If that prophetic word leaves them as an abandoned Samaritan, if it leaves the woman with many husbands in her state at the well because of what she did, if it leaves the man on the cross with no way out, it is not God. How did we get here? except by the hands of people. The doctrines of devils, the doctrines of men, people wanting power and control, people wanting to be in charge. Oh, you the devil, you the devil. you going to hell. Who are you? I've been to hell already. If the enemy of my enemy, like Paul was, can get a second chance, who do we think we are trying to speak for God outside of his new covenant intention? I'm asking you to study the new covenant, study the Christ of today. I'm gonna prove it to you. Here we go. Get your Bibles. Y'all ready? This is, a, I'm gonna challenge you this week. I'm gonna challenge you with this. Matthew 5. Oh my goodness. Here we go. 
How in the world is Matthew 5? What does that have to do with prophecy? What in the world does that have to do with prophecy? Because I grew up in vacation Bible school, school learning, you know, the Beatitudes. And I thank God every day for that impartation. I think I've told you all multiple times that one of the things that I did when I first got saved, I had to know, because people kept saying Jesus never said anything except what the Father said. And I had to find out if that was true. And so I went through all the words in red and I did everything I could to match them up with things God said and prophesied in the old covenant. And I found all of them. I didn't, never thought I'd have use of that, but I, I can't get out of Matthew five and seven and let me through seven, five, six and seven. And this is why I'm gonna give you this because it's necessary. Um, when we're reading the Sermon on the Mount, we hear Jesus talk about how not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law. You know, he says that. And, and people have all of their, their understanding about that. People will tell you that Abraham, God didn't get rid of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, he didn't. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not the, the, is not the mantle under which we worship God today because that was Mosaic law. We worship God under the, the release of grace that Christ brought. Everything, I tell you this every time I teach, has to be pressed under the weight of Christ. What makes Matthew 5 so significant, 6 and 7, so significant to prophecy is this was the first in-depth teaching Jesus ever gave the Jews those who were following the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what he did here is that he said, you'll see him say things like, it has been said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But now we do it this way. It has been said, if somebody slap you on one side of your face, you slap them on the other. But we don't do that anymore because of grace. You're going to see a lot of that in, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I want to challenge you because every area of the law that Christ had to overcome with grace, he taught on through the Sermon on the Mount. This is why I keep pushing serious Bible study people to study this out. Don't just look at the letters of Paul and don't just look at the things Peter wrote. Don't just look at the revelation. This is probably the most significant pr prophet teaching that Christ gave. Now, Christ was the chief apostle, the chief prophet, because he said there's no prophet greater than a human prophet greater than John E. Mercer until Christ. So in this moment, I want you to see Christ speaking. And I want you to hear him speaking as a prophet in some places. I'm going to read right now from uh, Matthew 5, and I just want you to follow me. I can't do all of this, but I want you to get an idea of, um, I'm get an idea of this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, listen to this, I want you to, I want you to see this not as a teaching, but as a prophetic word. This is Christ, I prophesy to you, blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually profit, profit, prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the poor in spirit, the humble who rate themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to go over here to the NIV. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's prophesying this. But listen, he's speaking to Jews. 
He's speaking to um, Pharisees in this crowd. He's speaking to all the people who have made themselves great. He could have said this. Y'all ain't humble. Y'all puffed up. Go sit yourself down. But he didn't do that. Are you all following? This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord. He's rebuking everybody. He is rebuking them, tearing them apart with love. Blessed are those who mourn for they have been comfort comforted. Oh my God. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What's the opposite of that? If you're not meek, you ain't getting nothing. I, I want you to see this. Christ is amazing when we look at him. But you know, we rather look at men because men elevate us. We love to see people's flesh come into the prophetic word because when you start listening to some of those prophecies and some of those things that the apostles and that Peter said, you, you know, they were mad. That's why I was trying to tell you all on Sunday, we got to see the context in which the letter was written. We got to see the context in which the sermon was released so we can get right perspective. But if you really want excellent perspective on how to prophesy, let's start reading Christ's responses. You're going to find that while he rebuked people, he left room. Oh, my God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they, for they will be filled. Well, there are some people that ain't going to be filled because they ain't thirsting for righteousness. There's a lot of implication in this. Listen to verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Everything about the old covenant was unmerciful. There was very little mercy in the old covenant. In the old covenant, God only took care of his group of people. That little small group, when they did right, he did right toward them. Oh my God, is this helping? See, we want prophecy to be these earth shaking words, all this hoopla and circus activity that men have made it. We want prophecy to be us walking into the room, hearing God like nobody else. We wanna have a stage for our release. But the stage is the heart of Jesus for the heart of the people. Blessed are you when people insult you. That ain't what the old covenant said. That's not, that's not the response of old covenant. Blessed are you when people insult you. God sent armies after people. He had hits placed on people. In the old covenant, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Oh my God. Oh, now here he is evangelizing these people, people who, who all kind of people. You are the salt of the earth. But then he says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? <laughs> it is no longer good for anything. Oh, you no good this, you no good. We prophesy like that, right? Listen, we can't, I, I want you to take your notebooks and your Bibles and I want you to walk through the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter five, we can talk about divorce, prophetic counsel. How did Christ counsel them on divorce? Prophetic counsel, the prophet speaking. We're talking new covenant. 
Yeah, he did. He sent the flood back then. Wiped down everybody. Thank you for saying that. That's a good point. He did. Look, he says, you know, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. But what we do, girl, God bless me with this new car. Whoa. I mean, my God. People put everything on social media and then give them, give God credit for it because they think that they're special. But they prophets, right? With all this wealth anointing, right? So they get on social media and brag. How are you revealing Christ in that? Are you increasing my faith? If you are blessed with that much money, increase my faith by buying me a car. Because that would, would, have, would have been Christ's response. <laughs> Let's be real. I'm challenging you. Get the circus out of your system. Take the fingerprints of people off of you. I beg you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Oh, we won't even go there with social media. We won't even do it. A lot of people love praying openly with random people. No private group. I, I don't do that mess because it's a mess. Sorry, you guys, I'm not fussing. I'm challenging you. We want to know what the problem is. If you want to know what the problem is, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 from a prophetic perspective from the greatest prophet who ever lived without looking at Paul, without looking at Peter, without looking at John. Look at what Jesus did because last time I checked, Paul said, I look to Christ. And he also said, follow me as I follow Christ. Holy Spirit is saying, I'm convicting you. I'm dealing with you because that reveals Christ. Jesus said, I came into the earth to show you how to live and to reveal Christ to you in the flesh. God said, I am the creator of everything and I created everything just so you would know that I have been revealed. Every prophetic word has to have a point in which Christ is revealed. LA, if I correct you with a prophetic word, it's with the intention of the Christ in you being revealed, correct? Correct. It's not to make you feel like a piece of crap. Right. And like, there's no hope for you. Now there's a firm word. I've had to remove myself from people because they're not listening to correction. So you just stop, what, it, what, it, what else is there if you don't want to hear? God is still with you. I'm just not involved for my peace. Maybe you need somebody else. I'll tell people quick. Maybe I'm not helping you anymore. Maybe the offense that you have against me is so strong that you might need to find somebody else to guide you. It's okay. So we're going to, Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus over this teaching. I pray that nothing has been misunderstood that nothing has been misconstrued. Father, I pray that understanding comes because we look to you. We look to you. We set the stage for you. We have nothing to prove. Lord, we can't do anything without you. Uh, we can't, yeah, oh my God. The Lord, I just hear the Lord saying, we have to recognize that the anointing is Holy Spirit. The prophetic is Holy Spirit. 
Presence is Holy Spirit. It's all the Spirit. It's not a different, it's not a, an anointing over here. It's, it's not a, a presence over here. It's not, it's not three different things going on. It's all the Spirit. It's the same Spirit. When you prophesy, you are literally saying the Spirit of God is speaking through me. And you're lying if Christ is not being revealed and you're lying on, on the Holy Spirit. You're lying on God. I don't, I don't prophesy that much. But when I do, and I know it's the Lord, I'll say it's the Lord, but I don't give God credit for everything that comes out of my mouth. The fear of the Lord has to be stronger in us than that. Sometimes I'll just say, I sense this or I see that. And that's because I ain't finna give God credit for this. Maybe that's just strong wisdom and experience and lived experience in my life coming from a, 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 a divine place of understanding. But to say God said it is a bold thing. We will give an account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. If I can't remember a prophecy, I'm not gonna try to conjure up something. I'm just gonna be quiet. Well, I don't know, cause I didn't write that down. The spirit is able to come upon me again and reveal, but I'm not gonna make him do it. People of God, we gotta get out of this circus. We're more entrenched in this circus than we believe. And I'm gonna tell you something. If you get offended over somebody saying that a prophecy is questionable, who are you loyal to anyway? Because I don't see people fighting over Jesus and we should be. We should be sick to our bone because we've let world stuff divide the church. God's greatest desire, everything laid down, all issues on the table, he only wants one thing. And that's koinonia, oneness with you. Not any of these world issues will be able to sit in his presence, not a one of them. If someone was taking their last breath today, they wouldn't care whether it was blue or red. They want everybody who they've ever loved to know that they love them. Why can't we do that while we're living? Why can't we give hope? Read 1 Corinthians 13. Prophecy must lead toward intention. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. All the words in red. And look at how Christ dealt with everything. Koinonia, it's um, K-O-I-N. I just spelled it, if you can see it. Uh, my apostle, Dr. Kalani Spake, writes extensively on that. Her whole ministry is based on that. I strongly encourage you to check out her books. I've never seen revelation like that before in my life. People don't teach on unity like that. They just teach their perspective. But I hope I presented Christ to you and his intention. You cannot understand prophecy without understanding why Christ came and what he wants. And all he wants is you. That's why he hates division. That's the thing he hates most. So if there are, LA, we can stop the recording. But if there are any questions or comments, or, I'm here to answer a few questions. Amen or have comments. 
if any of you want to share, speak, or give a view and opinion, we're open. Okay, before we um, get to your questions, um, Varuva has posted on how to give. If you were blessed by this uh, teaching, which I know I was, and you want to sow into this word, please follow uh, what Varuva has posted um, on Facebook right here in front of us here um, to the ministry, paypal.me slash voices of Christ. Don't forget the S on voices. Um, if you want to sow directly into Apostle's life, or if you want to um, give your tithe and you belong to the conservatory, please um, give to her PayPal and uh, her new cash app, Scribal Commanders with an S, okay? So uh, thank you so much. Praise God. So uh, the first question, Apostle, it says, how do you break free of the prophecies that were spoken in error over you? Oh, wow. Um, I'll just say to you, when it comes to that, you just, let me I'm gonna tell you, I'm going to pray this. Who is that as, asking that? Um, Darlene Ingram. Darlene, can I have permission to just pray for you? Real, I'll give you an example of prayer. She's on Facebook, so um, it's a little bit of a delay, so okay, one, one moment. If she um, hears me, I can do it a different way. Um, what I do is, this is what I suggest. You don't, the prophecies that were prayed over you, all you have to do is renounce them. Yes. You can renounce and you can denounce them. It's, it's, it's as simple as that, but you have to make sure that you fall out of agreement with them. This is, uh, this is how I pray. This is one area that I pray for myself every night before I go to bed. This is how I pray because I've had, I've had encounters supernaturally in which people pray their will over me, trying to turn my will. And I stand against that kind of stuff and real hard. But I pray things like this. And I, I usually pray, Father, I, in the name of Jesus, I come against every idle conversation, every place of chatter, every word of prophecy, every place of prayer that is against my will and against your desire for me. I stand against those trying to control me through their words. I stand against prayers of agreement where people have come together to pray for me in a specific way, where people have prayed concerning my son, my daughter. That's how I do it. And I do not ask God to cleanse the atmosphere. Father, in the name of Jesus, uproot every seed planted in my ear that was not you. Dig it out, Father, any dross, it, clean it. You know, I, I do that. I pray like that over myself. If I don't do it every night, I do do it every week. Because sometimes your atmosphere can be really shaken up by things that people loose in the atmosphere concerning you. Yeah. So I destroy it. And I begin to pray over myself. I stand in agreement with every word of declaration, every prayer, every word that gives life and lines up with your plans and processes for me. In Jesus name, I stand in agreement with that. I stand in agreement with things that will prosper me. And so I pray like that. And I pray like that for others for others, those that are with me and that I walk with in ministry. I pray that even when I'm praying for my own mentor, I pray like that. I'm like, we're not having that chit chat in the spirit. Yeah. We're not having that. And so I hope that helps. The other thing that I want to encourage you on is sometimes some of us have friends and relationships with people and we need to use our no voice. And, and I have no problem. People ask me, can I pray for you? No, I really don't need you to pray for me. I have a prayer team. Man. There's not, you're not evil for saying that. <laughs> right. You can say um, thank you, but I've had prayer today because religion makes you feel guilty for turning down prayer. Mm -hmm. Some people pray from a place of death, not life. Yeah. They'll spend all day rebuking demons off your life that don't even exist. Right. So you don't, they conjuring up things. You don't need people 
in their imagination praying for you. When people get mad at you, they'll say things like, well, I'm just going to go pray for you. No, uh-uh. Lose my name in the spirit in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Forget about me. You don't want that. <laughs> so, so we have to, and if you have friends that now discovered their prophets, we see that kind of stuff happen all the time. Now they think you have to receive them as a prophet and you have to receive their word. You will find people will be highly offended if they believe that, that you are not receiving their prophetic word. So you have to set boundaries. You're not my prophet. You're my friend. Just be yeah. my friend. I don't it's need true. you as my prophet. So right. I was just want to encourage you all, all my intercessor, you can choose. I usually ask people, I know it's not protocol for a lot of people, but you have to be careful when you're a leader and people know you, you have people praying for you that you don't even know. And sometimes you have to go in the spirit and shut that down. Yes. Shut that down. Please shut it down. Yeah. I get inboxes all the time. How can I pray for you? I block them and delete them from my friends list. I don't even know you. Don't need you praying for me unless I ask. You know, so we have to be very, very careful about that because that prayer comes with a lot of prophecy. It's not just prayer sometimes. It's declarations over your life. Mm -hmm. And okay. some people can hate you so much and have such um, disdain against you that they're actually binding you or trying to bind you. Going into an area I'm not really ready to talk about um, online, but I just wanted to, to share that. I hope that helps. You don't have to receive it. I don't care who it is. Yes. You do not have to receive it. Amen. LA, you have anything to add? Um, I was just going to add, just like how you prayed for uh, incorrect prophecy and declarations, I wanted to um, also add, that's also similar to how you pray over those who you mentor concerning the laying on of hands. Mm -hmm. when, when people have laid hands on us errone erroneously or tried to posture, apostle prays like that also when it comes to people laying hands on us or in the past had laid hands on us. Um, so I just wanted to just to mm -hmm. say that as well. Yeah, I don't. Now I'll tell you, I don't let people touch me. Right. I'm, the the good thing about Corona is that they won't. <laughs> ah. Right. <laughs> but, but I don't like to be touched like that. Mm -hmm. And um, usually when I'm going and ministering at a church, I'll tell the leaders while I'm on the pulpit, I do not want anybody to prophesy to me mm -hmm. um, openly. And I do not want anybody laying hands on me because right. if the pastor tell me I have freedom, that's my first step into freedom right there. Yes. Is I let them know before I speak that they do not have permission to prophesy to me. I get plenty of prophecy from the people entrusted to me. I have a wide range of leaders. Most people don't know. And I don't, most of the times when people prophesy to me, I've heard it before and mm -hmm. I don't get a lot of prophecy anymore. So I'll say that I rarely get prophesied to, but when I do, it is God. Amen. It is God. So you can set boundaries for yourself and you'll make some people mad. It's okay, but you got to guard your own heart and your own spirit. Yes. Don't be ashamed for doing that. Don't ever feel bad for guarding your own spirit. If you are wrong about it, trust me, God will send another prophet. He'll send somebody you can receive from. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, someone asked the question. Let me find it because they are typing away. <laughs> oh, how can you discern a healthy church? Okay, that was a question. Oh. <laughs> on that one i'm gonna recommend my book apostolic mentorship yeah please get that book um for those that are trying to find a healthy church um because that's so broad that's so broad but i will tell you the better question is how to find healthy leaders yes 
not so much as the church because the church is going to be full of sick people. And I will give you this one piece of advice and I don't know if it's going to help but whenever I've joined ministries, I join ministries to connect with the leadership. I never join ministries to connect with the people in the fellowship. I, I get to know the leadership first, and then I build out all my other relationships from that point. Um, because people can get caught up in other people and they'll leave the church because of a bad experience with one of the ministers and it had nothing to do with the pastor. So if you want to have a place to grow, get to know the leaders. That means you got to hang out and be best buddies, but focus like the Bible says, focus your eyes on Jesus. He tells us that because everything else is a distraction, but get my book apostolic mentorship is it's $12. It deals with healthy leaders. Yes. It can apply to the workplace. It can apply to um, a local church. It can apply to mentoring worship, um, mentoring relationships. But the one thing it does, if the environment is toxic, you'll never have to question it. Mm -hmm. And it's just too much to be able to teach that online. But maybe that will be a good, good topic one day to just have Q's and A's about that. But that's an excellent question. Yes. Um, someone said this teaching is like, released capsules will be studying and immersing my, myself way after this moment. Praise God. Hey, Amen. Thank hey. you. Karen has her hand raised. Yes, yeah, she can. She can let her speak. Hi, be. Karen. Hey, how are you? I am well. Good to see you. You too. Hey, I was just thinking about, um, I don't know if it was Sunday or last week, but anyway, you talked about um, certain books of the Bible to focus on, and you mentioned John, you mm -hmm. mentioned Colossians, and I can't think of the other one right now. Those um, are two. Yeah, so um, I actually went back to John and over the last week, and I haven't made it out of the first chapter yet. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but um, it just made me think of what you said starting off tonight because you talked about um, let's see how Christ is revealed, and so in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. So mm -hmm. it just made me think of that whole chapter, and the chapter also mentions that. The law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's also in that chapter. So that, that is a really good chapter that kind of brings together what you taught about tonight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me. So I just wanted to mention that as another good, um, good reading material for people. And I agree with that. That's really, to be honest, why I pushed those books. I'm so glad because... I know it sounds like I'm running my mouth because I talk a lot, but I'm really speaking scripture when I'm talking to you. And you should be, if you read the Bible, you'll recognize it. And I love, the book of John is the book. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. And the first part of Colossians especially, but I'm like that with the book of John. I reread that book every year, sometimes more than that. And uh, it keeps me rooted and it keeps me in humility. So thank you for that, Karen. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So I don't see any more questions, Apostle, on our um, the Facebook Live. Let me just go over here in the Zoom. Okay. Um, just a lot of thank yous and um, people saying yes and echoing what you were teaching. So they were getting it and enjoying the teaching. Um, all right, anyone else have any questions? Um, oh, someone said it's an eye-opening book about your, the mentorship book. Yes, it is. Oh, yes. thank you. Absolutely. And um, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to share something that Holy Spirit um, as you were teaching, um, spoke to me softly. And I just want to share it with everyone to encourage you. Um, this is what I heard. 
uh, trust him in the simplicity of his released word. Look for him in the still small voice. Once you do this, you will, you, once you do this, you will see that you are guarding your ear gates more carefully. So that was in response to apostles teaching when it comes to releasing the prophetic word and how sometimes when we're raised in a religious environment, we're looking for bells and whistles and walking on the chairs and throwing water and <laughs> all this other stuff that, um, you know, in other words, Holy Spirit does not have to perform for it to be a prophetic release. So that's what I heard. And I just wanted to share that with you all. Amen. Amen. And I just wanted to clarify something from Sunday. Um, I wanted to just, you know, be in agreement with you all that I know some of you had mentioned on Sunday that, you know, getting in the father's lap is a way to help you heal because you didn't have your father's. And I wanted to acknowledge that you're absolutely right, that that is the case. I agree. The only issue that I have ever had with that teaching is that some people don't know how to move from that place. And so that there always has to be a place that pushes us into um, maturity. So that was my point. Um, somebody asked, how can I order this shirt? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of them here at the house. So give me your size. And when you come over Thursday, I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so Let's clarify, Apostle. Oh, she and it costs, oh, go ahead. She doesn't mean come over as in a gathering of a group oh. of people. Yeah, That's no, not no, what she no. meant. Okay, no, I just want I to meant, make sure. I meant I'll leave it on the porch. <laughs> That's what she means. She doesn't mean, no, literally. She means people are picking things up Thursday. Yes. They're not going in, okay? Y'all well, shelter in place and stay out of groups. Okay, sorry. I just so I have this shirt and I have um, his master scribe and I'm working on getting some colors done too and some um, other things, so you know so it'll be great so just let me know the pricing for the thing is if you if you want the shirt you will it's inventory so you have to buy it at the scribal arsenal and once you purchase it i'll just print it out pack it up and give it to you so yeah we have some here at the house i'm just terrible at shipping so i want to um i'm getting better with paid orders but y'all y'all gotta pray grace for me for that i'm not the one I hate the post office. It's not about shipping. It's standing in the line at the post office. Right. <laughs> and so, so it's, um, I am his scribal prophet and we have a lot of stuff, but yeah, I'm really excited about this. So please get your shirt. Next time we have a gathering, we're going to all wear our gear. Um, um, so I have someone that said they trying to send you a, um, cash app and each time is saying unable to send so i just told her to send it to my cash app and i'll get it to you oh that's fine um that's interesting i'm gonna text send you something and um la just real quick just to see what happens okay i don't know why i have such a hard time with cash app i'm about to uh, let me test it i'm about to test it real quick okay so i'm sorry guys but Again, I want to, um, oh yeah, Mashana, you're right. I'm going to do that. I, I, I keep forgetting to do that. I just have to find space for stuff. My, I have to sneak stuff in because my husband just, he's like losing his mind the way my um, whole office setup is right now. <laughs> okay, it's there. Um, so for that person who said that they are not getting it to you, uh, make sure you're spelling it right. Scribal commanders with an S. Okay, yeah, that's probably what it is with an S. So that may be it. Yeah, because, yeah, I'm getting things. So thank you. Yes. Okay. So hopefully you can scribal commanders with an S. So if you all, again, I just want you to know that if you're, I'm not the type of leader that's offended by people asking me questions are wanting clarity on things that I teach. I don't get mad. In fact, it challenges me to be more thorough when I teach. 
And I hope that it challenges you to be um, free of people who've stolen your voice because they've not let you share your opinion or your thoughts. I have a real problem with that in the body of Christ. I used to be that kind of leader until I learned better and um, had to repent and help other people heal from my own behavior. But I fell in that category of being raised by people that came from a generation where you did what you were told and you didn't question the pastor. But this is a different generation because we need to be able to learn and explore the Bible. So I just wanna encourage you and um, thank you for being a part of the call. Um, wow, just thank you. You guys are still here. So LA, yes. whatever we need to do, I am, I'm, I'm done if there's nothing else. Okay, yes, thank you, um, Shante. Also put, oh, Apostle, can you put the your website for your books, the new? Oh, and thank you, Shante, I miss yeah. you. Yes. Beautiful. And also Minister Christine posted that scripture from earlier with oh, where is it? Anias and Yes, that's it. Christine is the best. Yes, I knew she was for me. Do it. Okay, so that was wait, let me go back up. Um okay, it's not letting me, but I think it was if if you're still on here, Minister Christine, can you post the scripture again? And also, I'm supposed to remind you to post the um, what God hates scriptures. Okay, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to do that before I go to bed tonight. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, is this teaching from Sunday still up? Uh, she does. She will post. Wait. Oh, I'm a, I'll put it up. I'll put it up tomorrow. I promise. Okay. I hadn't even had a chance to do that. I got the scripture. It says this. And I just want you to hear this one part. Um, um, what verse? I'm waiting for her to. Uh, okay, read. meanwhile, it's it's Acts 18, 20. Did she say was it 16 or 25? Let me see, 25. Okay, yeah, it was 25. Okay. So this is what it is. It's um, who is it? Aquila and Priscilla. Apollos is teaching, and this is what he said. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, meaning he was educated and knew the scriptures and had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way more adequately. And we know from that passage that what he did was he taught them, he taught him, they taught Apollos about the outpouring of the spirit because all he knew was the baptism of John. And I thought that was profound because the prophetic, they got a word from the Lord. So we see prophetic as giving these elaborate words, but I'm telling you, if we can start reading the scripture in just a very basic way, it'll change how we see the prophetic word when it goes forth because Apollos wasn't in error. He just didn't have enough information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. Oh, and Christine, she posted the scriptures also that I was talking about on um, the things that God hates. I'm just going to read it because I think we need to. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven are detestable to him. And I, all I want to say about this is in all the scripture, you're not going to find many passages with this type of language. So when you see the word abhor, the word hate, and God is using those words, pay attention to them because men have their little stuff that they like to hate. But when God says he hates stuff, we need to really pay attention to it like the fruit of the spirit part. When he starts talking about the evil fruit, pay attention to that. Galatians 5, 19, I believe. 
and also Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Pride, the lying tongue, the shedding of innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that run quick to evil, and a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. But the, uh, the version of the scripture that I like is New King James because it uses the word division. And because God is a God of oneness, anything that causes the bride to scatter is something that he vehemently hates above all because he wants us to be one. So any prophecy that doesn't reveal that about God is you have to wonder if it's the Lord. Yeah, the shedding of innocent blood, it refers to gossip. It refers to um, false accusation. It refers to anything that causes a person to grieve mm -hmm. and to die in their spirit. Yes. So if it causes death to their spirit, it's it's part of shedding innocent blood, innocent blood, including the actual act of murder. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, but we'll talk about that more because that goes into our next principle next week. And LA, thank you for what you shared. That was powerful. Amen. I so appreciate you. Oh, thank you, Apostle. You too. All right. All right. Thank you. So I don't see any more uh any other questions here. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening for Bible study. Uh please have a safe uh Thanksgiving. Uh yes. please wear your mask in the event that you have to do something and go out. Um and just know that people, our loved ones can possibly be contagious. I just have to say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you, LA. We hear you. Because <laughs> we are going to live through this holiday. Yes, we need We're to gonna live. live. You all be blessed, covered in the blood. Yep. I'm telling you, nobody's going to be lost this holiday. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. Good night. <laughs>